Hello, my name is Chad Ragsdale, and I am a professor of apologetics at Ozark Christian College in Joplin, Missouri. And uh, welcome to this series of videos uh, where we will be offering an introduction to Christian apologetics. This first session, uh, we're just titling, What is Apologetics? What, what do we mean when we talk about Christian apologetics? And in order to introduce the topic, I want to talk about uh, two circumstances in my life when I was in high school that kind of led me towards the study of apologetics. I didn't know that's what it was called at the time, um, but these circumstances led me towards this, this discipline. It led me towards this study. The first circumstance was uh, when I was a junior in high school, um, my sister, my older sister, died in a car accident. Um, she was on her way to church one Sunday morning, and, and she was in an accident. She died suddenly, and um, that circumstance really shook me to my core in all sorts of different ways. Um, but it caused me really for the first time in my life to start asking difficult questions about, about this faith that I had always just kind of grown up assuming to be true. But for the first time in my life, I started asking questions about, is this what I believe in? Is it actually true? Is Christian hope really real? And I began to search out answers to those difficult questions um, for really the first time in my life. And the second circumstance was about the same time when I was in high school, I was working at, a, at an environmental laboratory. Um, I was just this high school kid doing kind of menial work around the laboratory. And I was surrounded every day with a lot of people who were very scientifically inclined. They had degrees in chemistry and biology. Uh, many of them were agnostic towards faith. Um, some of them were actually quite hostile towards faith. And knowing that I was a Christian kid and knowing that my dad actually is a preacher, um, they would pepper me with questions, um, sometimes just all day long, just ask me questions about my faith. Why do you believe this? Do you really believe that? And again, for the first time in my life, I'm, I'm faced with this, um, with this question. Why do I believe what I believe? Are there good reasons for me to be a Christian? Um, and so these two circumstances, personal tragedy and also this experience of working around a lot of unbelievers and agnostics, it really led me towards this study of defending what it is, I believe, as a Christian person. And we call that study apologetics. It actually comes from a word. In Greek, the word is apologia, apologia. And um, it sounds like our English word apologize because the two words are related to each other. Uh, when we apologize for something, we don't just say that we're sorry for it. When we apologize for something, we actually give our reasons why this uh, thing happened, why we did this, why we said this, whatever. That's, that's what it means to apologize. We give reasons. And this word apologia means to offer a defense. It was actually a legal term that was used. If you were brought up on charges in court, uh, you would have to come before the magistrate and you would have to give your apologia. You would have to give your defense. And we find this word used um, in um, several different places in the New Testament, but prominently in 1 Peter 3.15. And I want to read this verse for us. It says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer. Now, um, that the English translation kind of covers up this word, apologia. Always be prepared to give an answer. That's, that's apologia. Always be prepared to give a defense. Uh, and then it continues on. Uh, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And so... In my own life as a high school student, um, I was faced with the circumstance where I had my own questions that I was asking of my faith. Um, I, had, I had my own dilemmas, my own struggles, and that led me towards this study of a, a defense for what it is I believe. At the same time, I was asked by all these agnostics, all these people who are hostile to faith, give me the reasons why what you believe. I was living out the words of 1 Peter 3.15. And this verse assumes several different things about the nature of our faith, okay? So one, one thing that um, apologetics assumes is that faith is reasonable. Now, we know that we, we worship a God of mystery and wonder. 
Um, but that doesn't mean, therefore, that our faith is somehow irrational. Um, apologetics, the, the defense of your faith, assumes that there is some sort of rational justification, some reasonable justification for what it is we believe. Another thing that apologetics assumes is that there's something about the Christian faith that is essential, that the, the faith is not just worth defending, but it's essential to defend our faith. Um, it also assumes that there's something about our faith that is unique. Our faith isn't like any other faith. Our faith is not just essential, but our faith is unique. Uh, believing that Jesus is Lord is a unique claim, as, as well as an essential claim. It also assumes that there's something about our faith that is historical. Our faith isn't merely, it's not, a philo it's not just a philosophy of life. Our faith is grounded in something that happened in history, and as such, it can be defended as a historical claim. So these are all the things that the study of apologetics assumes. It assumes that there's something reasonable about our faith, something reasonable that we can give um, a defense for, that it's essential and unique, and also it assumes that our faith is historical. Now, going back to that verse real quick, I want to just bring out a few different things that we can learn about the practice of apologetics from this particular verse. So I'm going to go ahead and reread that verse. And if you're following along at home, I would encourage you to have this verse out so you can follow along with me. It says, uh, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So there's a few points that I want to make from this verse. The first point is this. Christian apologetics starts with our own discipleship. It says in this verse, "Revere, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Revere Christ as Lord. What this means is any reasoned defense of our faith has to start, it has to begin with our own discipleship where we've set apart Christ as Lord in our life. Now, this doesn't mean, though, that, that there's something about faith that is just it's our, our personal feeling, it's our personal emotion, it's whatever. It's like, no, what Peter is saying here is that we have in our own heart, we have set us aside Christ as Lord. We are convinced of it ourselves. And so for me, as I began my study of apologetics, that's really where I had to start. I had to start with my own heart. I had to start with the condition of my own heart. Have I uh, in my life set apart Christ as Lord? Have I cared enough about my own faith to study it, to learn about it, so that then I'm equipped to answer the questions that a skeptic might ask? All of our efforts in apologetics have to begin with our own discipleship, that we have set apart Christ as Lord. The second thing that we learn is that apologetics is really for everyone. Apologetics is for everyone. If you're watching this video series right now, hopefully you know that, hopefully you recognize it. You don't have to have an advanced degree in theology or philosophy or history to, to practice Christian apologetics. Peter, when he was writing this verse, he was writing this verse to a group of Christians who were generally on the lower level of society. These were not highly educated individuals, but he tells them, all of them, always be prepared to give an answer when people ask you about the hope that you have. So apologetics really is for everyone. It's not, it's not optional. And so um, one of the things that I like to tell people is one of the basic things that you can learn is you can learn your own story. When people ask you for the hope that, you, for the reason for the hope that you have, one of the first responses that you can give is, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you about what God has done in my life. Let me tell you about what knowing Jesus, the difference that's made in my life. Like that's that's the first step that all of us can take. We've set apart Christ as Lord in our own heart. And now we're prepared. Each one of us who have done that, we're prepared to give an answer. Here's why I have this hope in Jesus. So apologetics is for everyone. Um, 
And then thirdly, apologetics is contextual. And here's what I mean by that. Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer when anyone asks you for the hope that you have. Apologetics is others oriented. So a person asks me, why do you believe what you believe? Or a person tells me, here's the problem that I have believing in God, or here's the problem that I have with faith. So apologetics, it doesn't really start with me. It, it, it starts with the person who's asking. And so because it's contextual in this way, apologetics requires that we listen and we learn from people about the background of the question that they're asking. Um, that we're able to speak in, in ways that they can appreciate, in ways that they can understand. So apologetics is always contextual. And then lastly, um, apologetics is done in the spirit of Christ. Apologetics is done in the spirit of Christ. He closes this verse by saying, do this with gentleness and respect. Do this with gentleness and respect. Now, one of the things that we learn, um, for instance, in John chapter 1 about Jesus, John 1 says that the word became flesh, made his dwelling among us, and he came into the world full of grace and truth, overflowing with grace and truth. That's the way that Jesus came into the world. Now, if that's the way that Jesus came into the world, then that's also the way that you and I go into the world as well overflowing with, full of grace and truth. Um, I heard this proverb one time that always just kind of stuck with me. Uh, it's no use cutting off a man's nose and then asking him to smell a rose. And sometimes the way that we bring Jesus into the world, we're, we're kind of doing exactly that. We cut off people's nose, noses by, by hammering them with the truth, by hammering them like this is right and you're wrong and, and just being very, very confrontational, being very condemnational, um, or if that's a word, condemning. Uh, and at the same time, we're trying to show them a God who loves them, a God who cares for them, a God who cares for them so much that he sent his son to die for their sins. And so there can't be this disconnect between the message that we're sending and the Lord that we're representing. So we do this with gentleness and respect. And so I, I learned this firsthand. I, I began this, this uh, session by talking about um, uh, one of these circumstances where I'm, I'm working in this job every day, surrounded by agnostics, who all of them were smarter than I, than I was. Um, and they were asking, S difficult questions, questions that I really didn't feel like I had a good answer for. And, and that led me to uh, studying more in depth, trying to find out the answers to these questions. But so many days I felt like I was just falling short. So many days I felt like I was letting myself down, letting God down, like, oh man, I, don't, I just didn't have a good answer for that question today. When I got ready to leave that job, I got, um, I got a note from, from one of the guys, one of the guys who, he was one of my chief antagonists. And he, he left me a note, a very kind note, where he said, um, essentially, we've loved working with you. We're sad to see you go. Um, I was actually going away to college, so I had to leave that job. Um, we're sad to leave you go, but I wanna tell you this, of the Christians that I've met in my life, you were one of the first ones that I've ever met who was legitimately trying to live it out with integrity. And that meant the world to me, um, not because I was perfect. I, I was certainly not a perfect high school kid, um, but because I was, I was really trying in the midst of working at that job, I was trying not just to answer their questions, but also to show them Jesus in the way that I answered their questions. Um, and that, that was a, a really important lesson to me because when a skeptic asks you questions about your faith, they're not just listening for the specific answer that you give. They're also watching you and they're taking note of your life because they want to discover, is this real or is this fake? Is this just another fake Christian or is there something real and authentic about the way this person is living their life? And so all of these things are critical in our practice of apologetics. 
It starts with our own discipleship. Have I set apart Christ as Lord in my life? Have I taken my faith seriously enough to go deep into it, to ask my faith deep and important questions? Because you're never going to be able to answer a skeptic's question if you yourself have never struggled with these questions of faith, if you, if you haven't taken your faith seriously enough to dive deeply into it. So it starts with discipleship. Secondly, it's for everyone. Everyone who follows Jesus, we're going to be put in a position at some point or another where we will have to give the answers for what we believe and why we believe it. So are you prepared? Are you prepared for that moment when it comes? Um, it's also contextual. It's based on the questions that skeptics ask us. So we have to learn to listen. We have to learn to appreciate where they're coming from. And then lastly, apologetics is done with the spirit of Christ, with gentleness and respect. <laughs>